At Subway, start 2010 right with surprisingly low-fat choices. The Piled High Subway Club or Turkey Melt, fresh toasted under bubbly cheese. Both are part of a Subway Fresh Fit meal, a simple way to enjoy eating better. Subway, eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to BS Report. It's a Friday. This is a, a request from our editor, Rob King, to uh, discuss Kobe Bryant since he's about to break the Lakers' all time record. Who better to discuss him than Kobe's number one fan in the media, Jay Adande, and his number one enemy, Bill Simmons? How are you, Jay? When did that become his number one fan? I don't know. I just I, I just trying to look for <laughs> I think Kobe would find that humor. Yeah, I don't, you're definitely... Are you in the top ten? I don't know. Actually, you've been writing... You've written nice stuff about him lately. We, we know what, I think that's what's interesting is because he's kind of turned into a nice person, you know, and, and like I was telling you about, you suggested a few years ago, he used to just say, forget it. I'm going to be the heel, you know, the bad yeah, guy yeah. like in WWE. And I think he's gone the other way. He's actually trying to make nice with people. I mean, you know, he, he's not seeking out enemies in the media or on the court. Um, he's trying to go about this. He, he wants to be everybody's friend. And I think I think it's working for him. The most interesting thing that's happened to him, I think, in the last calendar year, is that Shaq has been revealed a little bit as kind of a cad, as maybe not a good guy, between the Steve Nash reality thing, which, look, you know, they could say all they want publicly about that, but all I know is that Shaq had an idea, and and by the time and Steve Nash hired an entertainment lawyer, and by the time that idea went on the air, Steve Nash was an executive producer. So obviously something <laughs> happened. Um, and then this Shaq Arenas thing, you know, which we still don't know if it was true or not, but man, if you look at at the Did Shaq you know? missed like four games, yeah, like right around yeah. the time he had to go to Washington, they were emails. Well, and then, well, now, though, wait, now one we more thing. know why. Now well, we know why. Now we know that, you know, if Gilbert Arenas is bringing guns to the arena, then, yeah, if, if you've got any type of beef, Gilbert is not the guy in the league you want to have beef with because right. he might be packing. And, I, and yeah, that's why I was, I was going to say that part and also the part where maybe that explains a little bit of Gilbert's mental deterioration if the Shaq thing was true. You know it what could, I mean? It could all tie in. And then it'd be, it would be amazing that Shaq then would be simultaneously responsible for downgrading two franchises. Yeah. Although the Cavaliers have pulled out of it, and right now are looking like the best team in the league. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, their emails are all this stuff, and who knows how true the Shaq Arena stuff was. But, man, it, it, it would go a long way to explain why Arena seemed to go off the mental deep end. You know, it's, as Stern said when he intervened, like he's really saving Arenas from himself almost, from the way he was acting. Um, but anyway, back to Kobe, you know. I, I, I do think we have to really think about that whole Shaq Kobe relationship. And Shaq is, he's so, he's been so lazy the last, he's so out of shape now. He just doesn't care. And, and I do wonder if maybe Kobe just got driven insane by that and by the perception that Shaq was the good guy when maybe he wasn't as great of a guy as everyone thought. Shaq wasn't in shape. Kobe's this hard worker. And, uh, maybe they were just destined to clash. Well, certainly their personalities couldn't have been more opposite. Uh, their games could have fit and did fit, obviously, well enough for them to win three championships together. Um, but I think one of the things, to Kobe's credit, and one of the reasons he won over the fans in L.A., I mean, he clearly won that battle. That's why he's still here and Shaq is gone, is that he tended to take the high road in public. So you didn't hear him say stuff. So even when Shaq was taking a lot of shots at him, especially when he first got to Miami, you know, Kobe just pretty much bit his lip, you know, give or take the occasional Jim Gray interview here or there. Uh, Kobe didn't say that much in return. And so yeah. I think that helped him out. So when... All the dust settled. You didn't have this long list of bad stuff that Kobe had said about him. And I, I remember I was living in L.A. when the whole thing really finally fell apart. And, you know, you had the Kobe trial was going on and all that stuff. And Shaq, Shaq had been the finals MVP for three straight years, was clearly one of the best 15 best players ever at that point. And I remember thinking, you know, I'm on Shaq's side here. 
Sha- yeah, m- maybe Shaq's a little out of shape, but at least I know he's a good guy, and Kobe's not a good guy. Like, maybe Kobe was just this guy who all he wanted to do was play basketball and throw himself into it and, you know, had his little picadillos and maybe wasn't the most social guy, a loner, all that stuff. But um, maybe maybe we thought about it all wrong. Is that possible? I think now you have to view it that way. And you also have to understand, and, and what people don't get, maybe one of the biggest misconceptions about L.A. is that it's a hardworking town. Everybody thinks it's Hollywood and you sit by the, you know, the, the pool and, you know, you're having drinks out at the Sky Bar or something like that. But really, this is a town, you, you know, the, the set workers, the, the makeup people, the lighting, the sound people, they're all on the set at 5 a.m. You know, if we're going to look at the industry yeah. you know, that L.A. is known for, if you're going to look at people that work in finance, you know, they have to be in the office at 6 a.m. or, or 5.30 a.m. for the first bell at Wall Street. So this, this is a town that gets up early. People drive long distances to get to work, fight their way through traffic. So it actually really does place a premium on hard work. And that's yeah been the defining aspect of Kobe Bryant throughout his career. He's always been a guy that's that's worked hard. You know, you can never take that away from him. It's interesting. You know, I remember looking at him after they won the championship in Orlando, and, you know, it's it's quite an arc to, you know, to go from being on top to splitting up the team to not making the playoffs to being bounced in the first round and wanting to be traded, and now he's back on top. And I, I didn't feel incredibly happy for him because I felt like he put himself in that situation. Everything that came about was as a result of his desire. Mm. But I said, you know what? He earned it. You cannot say that he did not earn this championship. You know, some some championships you say oh, they got a fluke, there's a lucky break. Kobe earned every single diamond that's on that ring. And when you you know you were there, you're covering the team. Shaq was really out of shape in for the 0102 season, which they ended up winning their third straight title. I I remember I'm remembering that correctly, right? I mean, he was he played himself into shape as that season went along. Yeah, but that was it was either that year or the year before when you know he delayed the toe surgery. Yeah, and waited on that. Actually, no, I'm sorry. That was after 2002. Then he delayed yeah, yeah. toe surgery, but but he, he he definitely was was taking time off. And you know, there's certain games he didn't play, and Phil Jackson would call him out. I mean, you had that going on. And so, in 0203, when the Spurs ended up winning, that was the year where I remember it just didn't seem like he cared that much. And we all thought it was because he was tired of Kobe's BS. Maybe he was to a certain degree. On the other hand, this is a guy who really only committed himself fully for one year. 1999-2000, that's it, you know? That's you look the only at, MVP, and, and that'll go down as a big regret, and that's the one thing Phil Jackson chided on. You know, and Phil let Shaq slide with a lot of stuff, but yeah. Phil, the latter part of Shaq's time in L.A., Phil would say he should have more than one MVP. He should lead the league in rebounding. You know, he, he put that out there for him, and Shaq never quite responded to that challenge. And never, you know, there was a lot made about his his free throws, how allegedly hard he was working, and... All that stuff, and I, I wonder if he even took more than ten free throws before a game. Did you ever see him like shooting free throws I, I for thought, an hour? And not only shooting free throws after practice, making them. Time that, that that's one thing I'll kind of give him a break on, just because I think it was just a mental thing when he got to the game, when he got to the line during a game, something about about it freaked him out. Because I've seen him after practice make free throw after free throw after free throw like he's Larry Bird. Really? I've seen him stay late and work on it. You know, there are stories right. that during the playoffs. You know, he'd, he'd get a gym, he'd bring in his, his free throw instructor. He'd seem like he'd got a new one every year. You know, he'd do extra workouts, he'd go to a high school gym. So it wasn't that he never worked at it. It's just something that he was never going to get good at. Some people just have this mental block. He was never going to be a good free throw shooter in games. Did you feel like he was a good guy? You spent a lot of time around him. I did. Him. He, he's one of the few guys that I've considered, you know, it, it elevated to a friendship level. I've been to really? his house. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I, I really like the guy. He's, he's always been good with me. I've Last summer, even, he was in town. I'd, I'd see him at a couple of restaurants or health club. You know, I've, I've always enjoyed talking to Shaq. You know, I've, I've enjoyed what he's done for the game. I've, I've enjoyed the whole attitude and persona that he adopted. So deep down, I think Shaq's a good guy. I, I, and, and that's why I've defended him through a lot of stuff, because I think the positives of him and, and his personality outweigh the negatives. I always loved him. And, in fact, in my book, I, I gave him a little leeway with the pyramid and everything because he never – Reached his potential. He reached like 90, I don't know, 91 percent of it or whatever. But um, it, you know, as he's the way he left Phoenix, and then I, I, you know, I've written this. He's left four teams on bad terms now. At some point, it stops being a coincidence, right? You know, right. And, that, and now, how's he going to leave yeah. Cleveland? You know, and it, from what I heard with the Phoenix guys last year, 
you know, a big reason that that, pro- that team went in the tank was because Shaq was so desperate to prove that he wasn't done yet that he screwed up their offense. You know, I mean, on the they, one they hand, were forcing the ball into the him, yeah, it just didn't work. That that did not work on that team. And now it seems like, at least in Cleveland, he gets his role. You know, and he sits on be- he sits on the bench in the last five minutes a lot of times. Um, you, you know, there was he's a okay with thing. It. They played Atlanta, and Zdrunas Ogaskis made one of those three pointers. How many big three pointers has Zdrunas Ogaskis made this year? But um, that's like his signature thing now. But Z made one of those threes. And Shaq's up off the bench making the three sign. You know, like remember how the all the Kings used to do it? You know, they'd make that sign for Pages Stajakovic. But uh, he was making a three sign and smiling. And, you know, he was one of the first guys off the bench high-fiving Ogaskis. And I'd never seen that side of Shaq. You know, I'd right. never seen him vested in the game and cheering and supporting his teammates, you know, when he's sitting on the bench in a crucial game. It's not like he'd never been out. I mean, we've seen coaches take him out because of, you know, his free throw shooting. And he would kind of mope and, and grouse on the bench. And this time he was up and he was into it and he was rooting on his team. I've never seen that from Shaq before. Well, maybe – well, Phoenix had good chemistry last year, or at least they should have. But maybe he's getting swept up in this whole LeBron thing. You know, he maybe is, and the chemistry. He's accepting his role. And I thought it was interesting. There was a TV interview, I think it was an ESPN game last week, and he said, I'm a high-level role player. That's how I view myself now. And for him to make that admission – and you don't hear him protesting. He, he always talks about how old he is. He used to always talk about how he's a superhero. He's from a different planet. You were things will never get me. And now he's talking about I'm old. I can't get it. You know, I saw him in Phoenix. I did the Cavs-Suns game uh, a week before Christmas. And he's in there, and he's saying he's talking about old this and that. And he kind of looks up, and he's like, man, we've been doing this a long time. And I realized he and I, we basically started covering, I started covering the NBA his first year in the NBA. So it just kind of reminded me how old I'm getting, too. But. You know, I can relate to just if, if you're out there and you, you feel like you can't do it like you used to, well, guess what? Shaq is now going through that same thing. So you can identify with Shaq in one way. The one thing you can't relate to is the extra 100 pounds he gained since you met him in 1992. <laughs> so I feel bad like I put on five pounds last year, but I can't even imagine. He, man, you see those old shots of him back in the Orlando. Oh, man. God. Wow. Well, the ESPN Classic, for some reason, was running this. It was the last game ever in the Boston Garden, which I went to. Um, 1995, terrible Celtics team. It had Todd Day, uh, not Todd Day, uh, Dino Raja, Sherman Douglas, uh, Dominique Wilkins, his one year. And for, so, for whatever reason, we almost beat the Magic. And that was the year they went to the finals. Beat them in, uh, game two. Game three, should have won and blew it. And this was game four. And Shaq is like, y- you just forget. This is, a, this is one of the all-time specimens that ever, I would even put him above Dwight Howard. It for oh, just yeah. being a when specimen. Because he, he was so strong. Dwight Howard just didn't have that brute strength where he just no. knocked people around. Shaq, re- Shaq could get a rebound and dribble the whole floor and duck it. You know, it's just, I don't think Dwight Howard could do it. Back then, he'd block shots. He'd yeah. be up, his hand would be up above the box on the backboard. That was a nice magic team. I, and obviously, the, the Shaq Penny thing was already deteriorating a little bit. But, man, they had uh, D. They Scott had shooting spot. threes. Nick Anderson. Yeah. Penny, who would look like he was going to be the next... Magic slash Michael. Ho Grant. Shaq, Horace Grant, a you know, championship tested power forward. The, their starting five was the best in the league. They just didn't have much. Yeah. Time. They just, uh, you know, because the crowd was so great. That was, it was really like just, that was, it was such a bad team, and the crowd just would not let them lose. And of course, they ended up losing. But for to win in, the, in that environment, it's kind of hard to believe they end up getting swept. But anyway. I think, um, I think Kobe would love the fact that his podcast has turned into a Shaq retrospective. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, one more thing about Shaq. Would you compare him to 88 Kareem or 89 Kareem right now? Because well, 88 Kareem was still situationally effective. Yeah, 80, and well, the problem is 89 Kareem, the Lakers depended more on 89 Kareem than these Cavaliers depend, depend on Shaq. Yeah. I don't think that's a valid comparison. Well, what about ability-wise, though? Because 88 Cream was competent. 89 Cream, I just remember being constantly sad just and just wanting yeah. him to be taken to the vet and put down. Is this, you know, he said, Cream said he didn't prepare that last year. He kind of mentally checked out. He's like, okay, it's my last year, and he just didn't give it his best. But I, Shaq worked out in the offseason. I, I, I can't make that comparison because, you know, Shaq is trying, and Shaq is just he's accepting a reduced role. He's so you're saying 88 Cream? Yeah. Because I he's still trying. 80, 89 Kareem had checked out. I thought 88. I thought Shaq was washed up. But then I saw a game within the last week, and I can't remember who it was against. Oh, it was against the uh, 
It wasn't against the Lakers. It was this week. I can't remember who they were playing, but um, they were playing him in crunch time, and they were actually going to him. And, you know, I do think they need him to beat Orlando. They're going to need something yeah. from him. Orlando, and, Boston, the Lakers, they, they yeah. can check for those. Those three series, that's it. They might, they, they could play him 10 minutes a game until the Eastern Finals, basically. But, you know, I wouldn't trade him now. I was of the opinion that they should trade him. And now I don't think I would. I think I would keep him for Isn't he worth that playoffs. $20 million? If, if he beats Orlando, and let's say they play the Lakers and he beats the Lakers, which they have so far, then yeah. he makes it worth the $20 million. You, you get your championship. Here's why I don't think they. <laughs> well, but so who guards Kobe and the Cavs? That that's that's the issue I have in a seven game series. I guess you could flip it around and say who guards LeBron, but at least they could throw people at LeBron. You know, Kobe could just if he was healthy, I think he could just run. Well, so that's the thing. Is he going to be healthy? Is his finger going to be right? Um, you know, and, and get back to Kobe. I mean, it started off as his best shooting season. He was shooting fifty percent after the first month, and over the last month, he's been shooting forty percent. Yeah, you know, and his fingers. It, you know, you wonder it's a, it's a fractured bone in his finger, and and you know, the prescription is rest, and he won't rest it. We we saw this coming though. We just knew, like, with the amount of miles that he put on that body in the last two years, that this would be the year things would start to happen. And the yeah. thing with Kobe is his his greatest traits are also his greatest weaknesses, and and this determination to play, and this you know this will, and he's going to be out there all eighty two, when really the best thing for the long-term health of the Lakers would be for him to rest and, and recuperate his finger. But I, that's just not in his makeup. I have a great theory for you. In fact, the, really the only reason I wanted to do this podcast was to tell you this theory and get your reaction. Kobe wins the title. Kobe now sitting, he's got to have some Five. house that looks he, that looks out on some ocean or something, right? He's got to be it looking is up out. up in the hills in Newport Beach, yeah. Something. Over he's, golf course, too. He's on his porch, his kids are running around, he's sitting there and he's thinking, I did it. I won my title without Shaq. What's left? What do I do? Hmm. Well, I'm at about, I'm at, I'm going to be at 25,000 points by February. Carl Malone, it's, it's kind of conceivable. And I, I think his mind just went to work and I think he now is thinking in terms of numbers, records, number of titles, number of points. All these number of minutes, number of playoff minutes, I think he thinks like that. I do think well, he's got that side of Wilt that is driven a little bit by individual records. And I and this is going to – the Laker fans are going to be mad. I'm sorry. But I think one of the reasons he doesn't want to sit out four weeks is because that's 500 points. That brings him 500 points less to the record. What do you think I, of that? I'm that. I, the numbers matter to him. And I think it's all about him building his case as the greatest ever. Um, and, you know, if he can wind up with the most points – and if he can wind up, I don't think he can get to Bill Russell, but he can get to six, maybe seven. He's got to get to six. He's got to tie MJ. Yeah, at the very yeah. least. And right. Then he can really start having that conversation. And it'll still be weighted because MJ was the MVP on all six of those teams, and Kobe won't be able to say he was the finals MVP for all six. So that'll be, But at least he'd have six championships, and he'd be obviously a major contributor to six champions. So I think it's all part of the master plan. And the numbers are a part of it. It's interesting. The game against Toronto, he was sitting on nine assists. They're up by a, a basket or two in the last couple minutes. And he's passing in situations that scream for Kobe Bryant to take that shot. Right. And there's no doubt in my mind that he was conscious that he needed one more assist for the triple-double. And this is why I'll never – the game. That's why I'll never buy into him totally. Because I do think he is a little too obsessed with the individual stuff. And – it's, you know, this is what I wrote about in the epilogue of my book. Everybody's making a choice. Every great player has to make a choice at some point of how much of themselves they want to give up to help the team win, all that stuff. LeBron, I don't know if you watched the game when, uh, you know, he, in Portland when he had 30 points in the first half, he ended up with 37. He just switched to magic mode the second half because right. they started double teaming him. And they asked him afterwards, like, you know, he had 30 points at the half. He said, like, I don't care how many points I have. He genuinely doesn't. I don't think he's keeping track of points, rebounds, assists in his head. He's just trying to get everybody involved in doing what it takes to win. Maybe he did a little bit in the past. He doesn't do it now. I really don't think he cares. I don't think we will ever see him score 63 points in a game. I just don't think but, he, but you know, he would he ever do it. Caught up in the moment. If, if you watched that LeBron's Wade Wade game, which was just fantastic, 
Yes. And certainly with Carter, you know, at that point it wasn't about what's best for the team. It's about, okay, I'm putting on the show. Dwayne's doing his thing. i got to get him back. At that point, it was not about the team. It was all about the show. And I love it. And but how long did that last, though? The showmanship. But that only lasted for four minutes. And it was in the second quarter. And eventually he snapped back into the mode of, all right, what do I have to take? That turned into a macho schoolyard thing, which is what made it so great. <laughs> the uh, the Cavs bench went crazy. Wade didn't like it. And then all of a sudden it was on. And uh, it was electric. I mean, I, I, I was out hard. of my seat for a, a January NBA game. Well, how big of a letdown was the second half, though? Oh, well, I, but, but there, was, there was some big plays, at least, at the end. It was, it was, yeah, there, but, but I mean, gay. When you disappeared. But that halftime, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, my God, what the hell is going to happen in this game? I had no idea. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, it just kind of fizzled out. I don't think the uh, – that crowd, the, they start these third quarters in Miami, and it's all empty seats. <laughs> what the, can Look, we the take their team? Game, you know, I'm thinking it's LeBron, it's Dwayne Wade, and there was nobody in their seats at the start it's of the embarrassment. game. embarrassment. Even as much as you might – Hate on the Staples Center crowds. If LeBron's in town, you saw it at the Clipper game. Yeah. This place is packed for a warm-up. Pace, and, you know, the Laker fans show up. Say what you want about them, but they do show up. And they Getting back to Kobe and his quest. Yes. It, it's, I, I talked to him about it earlier this year, and, and I said, because I thought that same thing. I, I thought he might relax. I said, okay, now you got your championship without Shaq. You know, was there any thought that, okay, I've done it. I can ease up a little bit. He said, you know what, I, I cannot stop. He's, he says it's not about getting more than Michael. It's not about this or that. He says it's from within. Um, and that, that's what he says, you know, whether or not you want to believe that. But certainly he, he has, he's as motivated a player as we've seen in any sport, you know, in the last 20 years. And, well, since Michael. And, and, and that's the most Michael-esque aspect. And that's what Michael sees in him. You know, Michael... Yeah. You know, he doesn't want to say that Kobe's better than him, but one thing he will give you is that he sees that same motivation and same desire in Kobe Bryant that he had in himself. Does he see that in the blackjack tables, you think, or just in the basketball? <laughs> <laughs> Shiny chips. I have a uh, quick question. Since you, since you brought back the, ven- the vengeance scale or the, yeah. uh, the levels of losing, yeah. I was wondering, I think it's time to bring back the vengeance scale, and we can tie this in to all-star snubs. Where remember probably one of the great things, and I reread your Vengeance Scale column. You didn't have it on there. Was when AC Green beat out Carl Malone for the All Star team in 1990, oh. and Malone went out and scored 61 points the next game. <laughs> that's an all time Vengeance Scale, isn't it? That's like yeah, an eight. That's a good one. Yeah, that's so, at so least like this? a seven and a half. So how about the league just kind of flex schedules and leaves open dates the weekend after the All Star announcement, and then they schedule games against teams involving. A guy who snubs. made the all-star team against a guy who was snubbed. Well, it's still fresh in the guy's mind. This guy beat me out. <laughs> that would be pretty neat. Wouldn't that be well, fun to watch in, in late January? And it would start getting you ready for the all-star game. The problem is all these guys are friends now. Even well, LeBron and, and Wade. It was, team. I think well, the most egregious snub is, is Al Horford over Josh Smith on the Hawks. He see, I would have. schedule that one, I guess. I would have had both of them. I would have had three Hawks, as crazy as that sounds, on my uh, Eastern Conference team. Uh, Derek Rose has been playing really well for the last five or six weeks, but was a no-show for the first six weeks. His and, ankle was hurt. Huh? His ankle was hurt. I know. He had a hurt ankle, which is funny because people are now writing like the light bulbs coming out on that stuff. The guy was playing on a bad ankle. But that team, you know, it's sub-500, and he really has only started playing well in the last – I don't know, four or five weeks. But Al Horford does a lot of stuff for that team. And I, and I think that's that's one of the reasons I like watching that team is because you can't say they have a best guy. You know, everybody's got their roles. Horford's the interior defensive guy and can occasionally post up guys, stuff like that. But I, to me, Josh Smith not making it came down to the fact that he's been a d- the, last, the last five years. <laughs> Joe, we can bleep that, right? Sure, we can bleep it. He's a d- I mean, he, this is the first year that he hasn't been a d- and the coaches are ne- are just not going to reward somebody because this is the one year they decided to start behaving themselves. And I think, you know, he got penalized for that. But I thought that what Don't he did. Don't you want to see him go out and just have vengeance on somebody? Well, it's. But it is a teammate. He'll, he'll beat Al Horford to every rebound in that game. <laughs> I'm all for anything that would have put Josh Smith in the All-Star game because he's exciting. You know, that's one more exciting guy. Although I guess having Derrick Rose in there isn't a bad thing either. But I was just happy Durant made it because – you know, I, I think he's having the most underrated season out of anybody in the league. And when you really look at that team and you look at how hard it is for everybody else that he plays with to score points 
in that game after game after game, he's really the only one who can create his own shot and do anything. And other teams know this, and he's still getting his points, and they're winning. You know, and he's doing stuff on defense. It's he's Jekyll and Hyde. For the people, he's Jekyll and Hyde though. I've I've watched games where he's just a zero. Like they, you know, they have to practically get him off the floor. And it's just from night to night. My point is, he doesn't know who he's getting. Am I getting five field goals from Russell Westbrook? I don't know. I just know I have to make my ten and I have to make my eight free throws. So, but what I, you have to like about Durant is that even though I agree, he, you know, he doesn't have a consistent group of veteran winners around him. You don't see him making scowly faces. You know, when somebody makes a turnover and misses yep. this is a shot, he, he loves that team. You know, do you follow him on Twitter? Yeah. He's always talking about how you know how much he likes his group and he believes in them. And if they lose, they're going to get back at it and get better. I mean, it's, it's just really fun to watch a guy who believes in his team. Him and LeBron are the two best teammates in the league of all the good players. And I thought it was really interesting when Durant's new shoe premiered that all of his teammates also wore the shoe. Name me another team where that happens. I don't even know if the Cavs could be talked into that. Could you talk Shaq into wearing LeBron's shoe? Probably not. No, um, I mean, because then you get too many big corporations. I'll say this. A lot of Lakers wear Kobe's shoe. You know, the Nike guys on the Lakers, a lot of them wear Kobe's shoe. Who did you have for your uh, top five MVP midseason? I don't know if I went to five, but I, right now it would be LeBron, Melo, Kobe. You know, I haven't thought about it too much beyond that. Maybe Joe Johnson, if, you know, if the Hawks are playing so well. Hmm. I had Dirk second. Wow. I you think- know what's interesting? And I was just at their game against uh, Phoenix this week. Is that I, I can I can't figure that team out. And I was talking to guys on the Suns, and they say, "Well, we haven't watched them that much." And I was talking to the beat writer Eddie Sefko, and a lot of it comes down to Dirk. You know, they have enough guys to keep it close, and then they give the ball to Dirk, and they just get out of the way. So he's, he's been really is carrying that team to one of the best records in the West. I I just think that team. That's almost like a ja- uh, a stack of Jenga blocks. That team with all the weird personalities and all the weird stuff going on, and. There's, they have too many guys. Like, you never know which bench guys are going to play. And Sean Marion, you know, he's always a loose cannon. Who the hell knows with him? And, but the fact that he's just been so money at the end of these games, I really think he's the number one crunch time guy now. I would it's certainly put him ahead of Kobe. I mean, it's no contest, him and Kobe. Um, maybe you'd put like, LeBron you against <laughs> What? You're against that? Still giving the, you're giving the ball to Dirk Nowitzki ahead of Kobe Bryant if you got three seconds left. In your down this run. season, I would, absolutely. Absolutely. After, Kobe's had some of his best shots this season. The Kobe Miami takes game. the Kobe takes the last shot in every game for them, 100 percent of the time. I mean, he's made three. You forget in the Milwaukee game, he missed the same shot in regulation. They shouldn't even had a chance to attempt the overtime shot because they were Milwaukee was up six and got jobbed. But I'm not saying Kobe hasn't made him. I'm just saying for the volume that he shoots and the fact that nobody else on the team ever gets to shoot them, I just think they're at a higher level. Name me someone else you'd rather have. Do you want Lamar taking that shot, Ron Artest? If I'm I mean, the other team. Dirk, Dirk, I'd rather have, you know, Jet Terry is a very close second to Dirk. Jet's very clutch. He is. You know, who on the Lakers is, is similar? You know, I'll, I'll give you, okay, Dirk's clutch, as clutch maybe as Kobe. But Kobe doesn't have a Jason Terry like Dirk does. But I'm just judging this year. And if my life depended on it, I would go with Dirk in the last 10 seconds. Over Kobe Bryant. This season, yes. Not last season, not the season before. I'm just talking about from what I've seen through 43, 44 games, whatever. Dirk is, Dirk is money. This year and for all time, I'm, I'm taking Kobe to make the last shot. Not over Jordan. Come on. I, I've been through this time and time again. Oh, stop. Go, go watch the Jordan highlights and look at the quality of his looks versus the quality of looks in, in, in the Kobe last second shot highlights. You mean the quality of his looks during an era where you could hand check and mug people as they dribbled? Well, if you if you look, usually he's got five, six seconds left on the clock. Kobe might have one, two, three, getting double teamed. He, you know, he's not getting a screen. Really, the only, and I, I say difficult, not like I can make it, but the only really acrobatic game-winning shot that Michael had to make was the shot over Elo. But the rest of his highlight tape, when it comes to buzzer beaters, it's you know, pretty standard pull-up jumpers. You know, one dribble to the right, you know, a little space, fall away. Well, let's agree that Bird. Let's agree that Bird was better than both of them. Um, No, (laughs) come on. What do you mean, come on? How dare you? (laughs) How do you you say come on? 
Nobody made more buzzer beaters than Larry Bird. Even if there's a five minute YouTube clip of them. He made like. Very comfortable with Larry Bird taking the last shot, but I'm not giving him the ball over Michael or Kobe. Well, you, the stats don't back up your Kobe argument because 82 games keeps track of those crunch yeah, time and stats. And his are you awful. Know, according to that, they'd rather have like, you know. Carmelo. Jarepko take the last shot. No. The, the Kobe's that's like not 15th true. on that. If you, I, I, I think Kobe was like 14th or 15th. You're going to tell me there's 14 guys you'd rather have take the last shot than Kobe. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the numbers back up that he misses a lot of shots at the end of games. And that we only remember the ones he make, but he takes so many that, you know, yeah, he's made three this year, but how many did he miss? I just think Dirk, Dirk has been out of his mind. And I also feel like when Dirk has the ball, I feel like he's going to make the shot with Kobe on that shore. Cause he's hurt. Now his fingers out, like his legs are a little tired. His, I think he's pretty predictable now. He's got that same move where he goes to the left and does the, f- the fade away, you know, for the most part. Yeah, but people know what's coming. It, it, I, you know, I really think it, it matters in the ebb and the flow what happens with that hand. You know, if he gets hit on the finger, forget it. It's all going to go south. Um, you know, it, in some ways, this is some of the most incredible basketball of his career to put up some of the numbers he has with this finger. Um, but it's, it's also made them really suspect. And it's kind of exposed the rest of the team. You know, Lamar doesn't seem that interested in scoring. He's doing a great job of rebounding. Ron Artest has been lost ever since he had that concussion. And then Pau Gasol got really soft at the end of that Cleveland game when they needed him. I would so not have given Gasol the, the team. I would not have given him the extension. I'm just not a believer in extensions when you don't have to do them. Like when was his contract up? For like a year and a half? You know, I wonder, what the hell I wonder are you if that's one of the for? things and and this this is no one inside is telling me this, but I wonder if that's one of the things that Kobe wanted to see done before he signed his extension. That he wanted to know Powell was going to be here for the duration. I really think Kobe has a very strong affinity for Powell Gasol. And he's he should. Been a little skeptical of him because he realizes, all right, if I'm going to get my fifth and sixth rings, I need this guy. Yeah. Well, he and should. He, he should. Like to him. him from the moment Powell got there, and you know, made sure he get the ball. It'd be interesting. Like it was, it was like Kobe got a new car or something. Went in and he couldn't wait to drive it around the street. He'd throw the ball in the Powell and he'd tell guys, you know, clear out, go around the other side. It's like he just wanted to watch Powell go to work. And it's like, wow, you know, he, he appreciated having a center now. Do you, you know, this thing, this, this, if you could have this Kobe and this Shaq in 2003, then the Lakers would have won three more championships with that group. You know, where, where Kobe, you know, understood that he can't do it all by himself. And Shaq understood that, okay, there's someone on the team that's better than me. You know, that, that, obviously you can't go back and do it, but if you could have this version of Shaq with this version of Kobe six years ago, seven years ago, the would, Lakers would have just ran the table on the lead. Would you agree that they basically have to make a trade for a guard if they're going to be serious about winning the title? I think they can do it with this group if they play well. Have you seen Derek Fisher this season? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's the same Derek Fisher we saw during the last regular season. <laughs> Only he makes 25% <laughs> of his shots now? But, but I think you might see the same Derek Fisher – in the playoffs, that you saw in the playoffs last year. I, I won't even say the playoffs, in the finals, because during the Houston series, Laker fans were <laughs> wanted to run Derek Fisher out of town. But I think he's still got a couple more big shots left in him. Wow. I, I, I just don't agree. I think he looks completely washed up to me. Like He reminds me of Big Shot Rob in the last year. Was, San, was it San Antonio? Yeah. Yeah. It just became clear was, that he wasn't good watch. anymore, but it was like, oh, it's Big Shot Rob. He'll be fine. So he'll it's do like, it. <laughs> nah, he's washed up. Well, his last year in L.A., he was a little bit like that, too. You know, I think he was a little bit, you know, was, wasn't as, as good a condition, and he had that shot that rimmed out, remember, down in San Antonio. Yeah. And he just, he had a horrendous series. I think he made put, like maybe one three-pointer that series. Put it this way. You're playing the, the Lakers are playing the Celtics this weekend. The Laker lineup that frightens me is when Shannon Brown's out there. And that, that's a guy that I'm not sure why he just doesn't play 30 minutes a game. I can't totally figure that you know, out. He's one of them, reason. like, the first 10 minutes is great, and then when you get to 18, 20 minutes, he starts doing more things wrong. So he's a change you know, of pace guy, and that's it. Yeah, exactly. Like a utility infielder that is only or good for I was, about 250 yeah, at-bats. Go I was going to say, you yeah. know, there, there's certain relievers, you know, okay, one inning you want to see him, like the setup man, you know, you want to see him for one inning. But two, three innings, you know, maybe guys get a second look at him, second go around through the lineup. 
That's how it is with Shannon Brown. You don't think he can grow into something bigger than that, though? I really like him. He can, but maybe not immediately. It's going to take some more time. You know, he he has been asked to do this, to make contributions on a championship-level team in the NBA. It, you know, it, he's, he's still adapting to that. I don't even think that's what he signed up for. I don't even think that's what the Lakers signed up for. They're just looking for a little salary relief, and all of a sudden they yeah. say, hey, this, this guy can play. And to get back to Kobe, I think Kobe and Phil don't get enough credit for the way guys perform when they're aligned with those two guys versus what they do the rest of their careers. You, know, you can go back and look at a lot of guys, Devin Georges or Smush Parkers, when they're playing with, with Kobe and with Phil, the numbers really go up, and they never match those anywhere else. Except for Ron Artest, his career is over. But you don't put that on Kobe, do you? <laughs> no, I, I, I think that was... Have you ever rooted so hard for something to not work as for Ron Artest to not work in L.A.? Well, I knew it wasn't going to work. I, I had no failure, doubt. Though. It's, it's, not, you know, it's not weighing the team down. It, 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 that whole thing, I, you know, I wasn't sure if the personality part was going to work out. The thing to me is I just thought he was on the other side of the mountain. I, I saw it happen with Antoine Walker. When she can't get to the rim anymore, I, I for me, I saw our test was a guy who made 18 footers, and any time he got to the rim, he got blacked. And now we're seeing it even more this year. And the other part is, he's not remotely the same defensive player anymore. Now they're blaming the sneakers, which, uh, you know, I, whatever. I, I'm sure he's having some foot problems, but I don't think that explains the fact that he can't move laterally anymore. You know, I just don't think he can guard. Maybe he can guard the physical forwards like Melo. But he's not going to be able to guard the Dwayne Wade types. And we saw that when Miami and the Lakers went head-to-head. Kobe had to guard Wade. Like, and, is and that something you want in the playoffs? He was effective against LeBron. You know, I mean, yeah. You thought, you figure, okay, for Carmelo and for LeBron, that's where Ron Artest is really going to prove his value to the Lakers. And so yeah. far he hasn't against LeBron. And, them, and now Melo didn't really kill them when they went to Denver. They got destroyed by the Nuggets. Yeah. But Melo got in foul trouble. That wasn't even like a really Carmelo production. But I'm, I'm interested to see. They've they played Denver a couple of times coming up in the next few weeks. And so that's going to be interesting because I think it's going to be the Lakers and the Nuggets in the conference finals again. And for I thought the Lakers were a lock. Our test has, has really deteriorated enough that now I'm really starting to think that it's a little more wide open, plus Kobe's hurt. Denver, if, I still think they need one trade. You know, I, the loss and things been great. Aaron Aflalo was a freaking steal. That Warkenstein's great. That, he might be the best GM in the league. That guy just continues to nail him. But and I still think they need one more big guy. Too. It's not like he has yeah. a checkbook. His, the, what he did the last two years, I think, was the best job. I'd put that two-year stretch against almost anybody. I really would. Like it, Just left and right, just nailing things. But he needs one more guy, I think, to beat the Lakers. Because you're not going to beat the Lakers in a seven-game series with Nene and Kenya Martin. As your as your, basically your two guys that you're going to war with down low. I don't think I don't think that happens. Unless Carmelo is really that good now, and he's kind of tailed <laughs> off. You know, he got off to that great November, um, and then he had some injuries. But if Carmelo's really going to take that next step and slay mm-hmm. the dragon, see, I, I think their you know. issue their issue goes a tad deeper than that. I'm still not sure that Billups doesn't think he's this guy who should shoot in the last two minutes. And I don't know how that gets resolved. They had that alpha dog. It's, it's just sitting there. It's not like there's bad blood and there's nobody's mad at anybody else, but it never kind of works when you don't totally know who the best guy is in the last two minutes. I've we seen Bill well, jack up bad threes. A lot of, you know, he came last year and, and it's a very easy story. You know, sometimes sports writers will jump on the easy story. It's like, oh, they've got Chauncey Billups and he's a leader and that's why they're better. And now they're in the conference finals. Yeah, they won and two I was more talking games. to him in November and he said, he said, you know what, I'm still not quite sure how to lead this team. Now, I haven't talked to him since then, so maybe he's kind of grasped it, and he's certainly had more of an impact lately. But he was still figuring it out, even after pretty much a year on the job. And yeah. I thought that was very interesting, because I just thought he came in and just said, you go here, you do this, we're going to do it my way, I'm the guy that's got the championship and the NBA Finals appearances. And he said he was still feeling his way around a little bit. And you certainly saw a more assertive Carmelo this year, so I wonder if that forced Chauncey to say, okay, do I have to take a step back now? Is Melo trying to become the team leader? Mm. And I think as you've seen Chauncey assert himself more, and maybe he's finally figured it out, now they're a better team, and I think they're even more of a threat to dethrone the Lakers in the West. You know, it's an interesting lineup for them and that, that I think could give the Lakers trouble is when they play Lawson and Billups together, which they really don't do that often. But um, if as Lawson gets better, which is going to happen, that's a guy the Lakers do not match up with. 
You know, no, that's well, those they pesky have point guards. They just years, don't have yeah. yeah. Eight years. Yeah, it goes back to time. Magic. I think it's Tony been 30 Parker. years. Yeah. You know, he used to kill them. Spud Webb used to kill them. They throw Spud Webb in there, and the Hawks <laughs> would just take off on the Lakers. But if you were playing the Lakers and you were a little little pesky point guard, that was your best game of the year usually. But um, that's what they – I don't know. They have some things that – where they match up, but then on the flip side, the Nuggets will never have anybody to guard Kobe, you know. And uh, that that's a good one. I also think... Aflalo did a really good job when they played back in November. Really good job. You know who did a nice job on Kobe? I can't believe I'm saying this, but Eric Gordon. Did you go to that game? Lakers at Clippers? Yeah. It was the one the Clippers won. Eric Gordon did everything you'd want somebody to do against Kobe. Like... Bothered him, never got caught up in Kobe's little, like, his little hand things and the things that he does to agitate people. Just stayed in his face, stayed in front of him, and just was, wasn't was afraid of him. It was the first time I actually thought Eric Gordon might become an all-star at some point in his life, which I've never Kobe, looking up before. that Denver game, Kobe was 7 for 17, and that was mostly a flawless guard in him. Well, that, I mean, God, what was Joe Dumars doing? He just he gave that guy away, basically. <laughs> I'd rather him than Charlie Villanueva for ten times the price. So you think Denver and the Lakers? Denver and the Lakers. And in the East? In the East, I think it goes Cleveland, Atlanta, the conference finals. That's why I'd have in the conference finals right now with Cleveland winning it. And you know, even though Cleveland always beats Atlanta, I watched those two back-to-back games that a couple weeks ago, and there's some seeds there for a legitimate. May, might be one year, and LeBron might be out, but. The, the, the way the personalities mesh with those two teams, that could be an awesome game, seven game series. And they like really like a Hall of Famer. You love Atlanta because they have so much athleticism, and then LeBron just athleticism just all by himself is worth like five guys. Uh, that'd be a great series. I want to see Atlanta Boston again. <laughs> I'm, I'm more I, interested in the Eastern Conference, but you know, as, as bad as they're going to be, as yeah. you know, you know, you're going to have four teams that really have no business being in the playoffs, making it in there, but. There's going to be some good matchups there. I mean, well, Orlando, Atlanta, Boston, Cleveland, between those four. You also have two teams that could legitimately shock somebody in round one. Do you know who the two teams are? In the East? Yeah. Nobody's getting shocked in the East. No one, none of the lower seeds are beating any of the upper seeds in the East. I think that could happen in round one. I think there's two teams. You think the Bulls have another one in them? No. I think Captain Jack... And the Bobcats could absolutely beat somebody. In no, a it's going to be the series. first time in the playoffs for most of those guys. I mean, that's, that's one thing you can't can't put your money on is, is new teams in the NBA playoffs. I'm like, just those, saying, the Larry Warriors, Brown. when they had Captain Jack, I mean, Barron had been to the second round of the playoffs. Steven Jackson had been, you know, those, they had some playoff bets. Felton won a title in, NC, in uh, at UNC. It doesn't count. Just a whole different Larry Brown. In the NBA. I just think the, the higher seeds in the East, and I know it's a long shot. I'm just throwing it out. I think this is a year where you can beat one of the higher seeds in the year. Like, I think you could beat the Celtics, as crazy as this sounds, in a round one series, because they're kind of a mess right now. And I don't like what I'm seeing from Orlando either. Like, Vince Carter went two for 13 last night. What do you do with him? Oh, that is not working. And and were you one of those guys that was high in that acquisition? I was never excited about that acquisition. I just like the trade for what, you know, they gave up nothing. But I thought they were going to keep Turkey, though, which they didn't. Um, I mean, see, I don't even view that trade in and of itself, yes, but I mean, I kind of viewed it as, obviously, this isn't the way it went down, but it was Turkaloo for Vince Carter. And I didn't like that for that team. Me neither. Didn't like it at all. Although I, I didn't like Turkaloo's contract either. Um, I think that's like the Artest contract where years four and five is just going to be a nightmare. Would you rather pay Turkaloo that money than pay, pay Vince Carter and Brandon Bass more yes. combined? And in a millisecond. For you? In a millisecond, I never understood the Brandon Bass part. The uh, the other team that I think could could it's fluky, but could do it in a round one is Toronto. How about them? I could see more than Charlotte just because again they've got some guys that have played in the playoffs before. Look at Charlotte's last. The look at Charlotte's last six weeks. I know it sounds weird, but um, and I also think they have one more trade to make. But um, I like that Jackson Wallace combo. I think those guys play hard. I think Felton's been great. It's just a team that's well coached and plays hard, and it's different than some of the frauds that we've seen in round one in year past. In years past, when was past, the last you time know? you enjoyed watching the NBA this much? It seems like every night I flip on whatever game you watch is going down to the wire. There's talented young teams, there's teams you know like Oklahoma City or Charlotte that are trying to yeah. find their way in the league. Memphis, you, you, we didn't even talk about Memphis yet. Grizzlies, Zach Randolph, Rudy Gay. 
It's, you can't go wrong watching basketball any night. Tariq Evans? And just think if Rubio had been on Minnesota, we would have basically, it would be 85% of the teams debate. would be good. Yeah. The, uh, I think the thing that's great this year has been the fact that Durant's team is now a must-watch for me. I don't know if everybody feels that way, but I always want to know what they're doing, and I always end up watching their fourth quarters and all that stuff. LeBron is appointment viewing every night. Yeah, I mean, he it, just and, is. And uh, I think we had taken him for granted a little bit. Not me. Maybe other people. Not in this house. <laughs> I mean, it's just like okay, LeBron's great, and then see, my problem is I hadn't seen him live in a while. Yeah. And he's a guy you have to experience live to, to see how fast a guy that big have to. Moves, to see how he can jump. You, you, you have to see him live. And I was lucky. Phoenix probably has some of the best media seats left, you know, since they, you know, <laughs> he, he evicted us from the courtside seats in most arenas, but. uh you know, I was sitting in the second row and watching LeBron just, you know, take off down the court. And it's mesmerizing. And just ever since then, I've, I've just been hooked on it. There are teams, I think last year there were a lot of works in progress. And we, we were hitting February and it was like, oh, guys are going to get traded or uh, they're waiting for cap space this summer. And nobody seemed happy with their team. This year it seems like there's a lot of teams that are happy with their team right now. They, you know, who saw the Memphis thing coming? That's a legitimate team. I would want to play those guys in a series. I know you'd probably, the Lakers will beat them, but they still, you gotta at least have to worry about double team and Zach Randolph, and there's just a lot of elements to that team. It's a professional I basketball give team. And Lana Holland's lot of credit, cause I, I saw him over the summer in Vegas, and he was, he was excited about Zach Randolph. He mm. said, yeah, I'm really thinking, I'm, I said, are you serious? And it was one of the first times I really thought I knew more than the coach, and he had no idea what he was talking about. No, you did know more than that, Coach. <laughs> you shouldn't be excited about Zach Randolph. This came out of nowhere. <laughs> but it he, did. He, be, he believed, though. I mean, I've seen guys skeptical. I've, I've, you know, I've talked to coaches. They've taken over teams like, well, I don't know about this guy. I don't know about that guy. You know, they've had a healthy dose of skepticism. Maybe they're proven wrong. But he was proven right about Zach Randolph. So i got to give him credit. He said, no, I think, you know, we can do good things. I like this, that, the other about him. And I'm, I was really questioning his sanity. But he was I, right. Well, you went to some Clipper games last year. I know I did. I watched Zach pretty carefully, and he did have the tools. There's no question. Like, if you if you had told me, would you bet your life that this guy will never average a 23-12 again in the NBA, I would not have bet my life on it. My question was that he was such a bonehead. You know, he just did some of the dumbest things I've ever seen in a basketball court. I never thought that he'd master that mental aspect enough that he wasn't just a detriment for whoever he played for. And now I'm watching this year, and in crunch time, they go to him, he scores, he gets fouled, he doesn't do dumb things. I don't know what happened. It's like they're yeah, putting him on medication. Three pointers. <laughs> did, did they put him on medication? Like, how does this guy all of a sudden not become a bonehead? Especially when there's no one there to really teach him the game. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not like there's this great sage veteran there to say, all right, Zach, this is how it's done. He's figured it out on his own. It's put it this way: they've demolished my idea of the secret in the book because you have Zach Randolph, who's was one of the most selfish guys in the league. You have Rudy Gay in but a aren't contract. But are they it though? But he's giving up the ball. Well, that that's what I don't get. You have him. All of a sudden, he's not selfish or he's unselfish. You have Rudy Gay who's in a contract year who should just be gunning for his own shots, and for some reason isn't. You have OJ Mayo, who's always been the star wherever he went, who's fine as the fourth option. How does that happen? And then you have, you know, Jamal Tinsley. <laughs> Top four, worst guy in the league, just happy coming off the bench, and I don't get it. It's it's a mystery. You know, maybe it's you know it's one of those bad news bad situations where you have so many people on second and third chances, and you know I mean certainly Zach Randolph here's a guy what Portland to New York to the Clippers you fourth know, chance a guy, uh, you know a, a twenty and ten guy you know one of the most rarest and most valuable commodities in the league who nobody wanted, and uh, you know same for Tinsley. Tinsley was just told to go away for a year. Yeah, you know they they paid him for a year to not oh, play two years. I think wasn't it? Wasn't it two? Well, over a year, yeah. Yeah, you know. So I mean, these are guys really grateful to have a chance and to have people believe in them. And, and again, that's I think it goes back to Lionel Hollins that he believes in them, and they're responding to it. I would go this far from what I've seen this year, and this I'm going to this this year argument, which I also use for you against Dirk and Kobe. If you had to go to, if you were down one with like 20 seconds left, and you had to go low post to somebody to either try to score a basket or to get fouled to take the lead. Is there anyone you would pick over Zach Randolph? 
I'm trying to think. On the low post, because Dirk, I'm giving the ball around the free throw line. Yeah, I'm saying you know, low Kobe's post. Kobe's going to get the ball on the wing. LeBron's going to do his little thing where he dribbles back out to half court. He is the number one money low post guy in the league for the 2009-2010 season. I think this is amazing. I'm, I'm just trying to process that. I, I mean, I, I got to do my trade value column, you know, the annual trade value column. Does Zach make it? Two years left, 16 million, best low post score in the league. I, I, I he kind of has to make it. He's, he's worth the money, right? At this point, Gasol is getting his ass shipped off. He's out of the column. Completely, he's not in your top 50. Not with that extension. I, I mean, he might borderline, maybe in the. You don't think other teams are taking making that money? I'm just saying, it, part of it is contract and stuff like that, and now that's they've basically given him the same bad contract that they've traded for. I'm not saying he doesn't deserve it. It's just, you know, at some point when you're making $20 million a year, it's pretty hard to trade somebody like that. Like, would you rather have him or Al Horford for making $3 million a year? For for the Lakers, you know, and, and the thing with them is money's not a concern. So, But who says I'm no faster? Out. If they call Atlanta and they say, we want to trade you Pau Gasol for Al Horford, you can pay Pau Gasol seven times as much money, or six, or whatever it is. Atlanta says, no way. We're not considering that. The Lakers, Lakers would at least situation. have a meeting. They're, they're, they're one of only three teams making money. So, so That's I, I amazing. Just, fi- finances, I mean, that, that's, that's a whole other discussion, and that's going to lead yeah. to the <laughs> shutdown of the NBA at one point. But, but you know, so th- this is one situation where, you know, finances really aren't an issue. And I, and I know that factors in your decision, and it should, because really – the, the salaries matter more than the stats now when trades are being discussed. But yeah. I think for the Lakers and for Pau Gasol, it's really irrelevant. Heinrich, any chance? Good chance? Decent chance? It, it, it could, but here's the thing. I'm not so sure if you're the Lakers, you want Kirk Heinrich at this money. When he's not making shots, he can't make shots anymore. Yeah, his stats are down. You, My question is, is it because he's out of position? Like, but he's, he's still getting open shots, and he's not making them. I mean, conceptually, you like the idea of Kirk Heinrich playing in the triangle offense. But he's shooting 38% this year. The Lakers need – it's too bad we couldn't uh, have freeze-dried players and then have teams bid in them. Because, like, if you said, we have the 1996 freeze-dried Steve Kerr, we're about to unthaw him, <laughs> would you like to make a bid? The Lakers would be like, $20 million, because they win the title with, Steve, with 1996 Steve Kerr. Nobody All they need is a, guard. is a guy. need somebody to guard those point guards. Well, they, they, you're not going to get the whole kit caboodle. They just need somebody who can make an open three. doesn't matter who. They don't care who it is. Just a point guard who can make threes. I can get this far with it without saying anything bad about Sasha Vujicic. It's right there for you. Or is, or is it just gotten to the point that it's not even worth you bringing it up? It's You know what it's like? It was like watching Sasha and the Lakers is like seeing Tom Sizemore in Celebrity Rehab. It's so <laughs> awful that it's, it's almost not even fun anymore. Hey, what happened to that guy? Went off the deep end. I mean, he's just not a we serviceable basketball player. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm talking about Sasha, but the, the guy is just a, a liability. And I don't. This is a guy who two, three years ago I really thought was at at least at Verizal level potentially. You know, you as know an what? agitator. His, his finals were one extended Nick Anderson. Yeah. You know, I mean, he he went over for the finals basically, right? So I mean, it's just like watching that those Nick Anderson free throws again and again and again. I think it's a tennis player thing with him. You know the tennis players, the good-looking tennis players that live in the life, going to these tours and did, like Marie Safin, going to these tours in different cities, having their way with whatever woman they want, and they just get soft. But that's what happened to Sasha. That, do you believe? Do you believe Jamel Hill's theory that if if the Lakers and Lamar Odom win the championship and the Saints and Reggie Bush win it, then you have to credit the Kardashian sisters? Man, that would be. I didn't, would, didn't would even think of that. See that coming? I, I would I would have predicted Zach Randolph having the season he's having before I would predict a positive impact by the Kardashian sisters on Lamar Odom and, and Reggie Bush. And and I would have predicted either of those things before Barack Obama greeting Khloe Kardashian with an I love your show or whatever he said. <laughs> <laughs> that that might have been a lower moment than the entire season of Jersey Shore. The fact that Khloe Kardashian was in the White House shaking hands with the president. And then he knew her show. He show. I mean, if you're going to criticize year one of the Obama presidency, and Lord knows there's a lot of ways you could go. That moment right there. It's got to be number one. He shouldn't know her fact, show. How about the fact that Kobe and his family went back for another visit, like a private visit with Obama the next day? Is that true? Yeah. 
so he said, you know, they they talked about some stuff, and you know, they'll, they'll probably, you know, revisit over the summer. But you know, okay, you know, I understand you bring the team in for the photo op, but at that point, don't you have to get back to writing the State of the Union speech or something? <laughs> then he has Kobe and the family over again the next day. Oh, man, I have no comment. <laughs> I'm dis- I will say I'm disappointed. <laughs> the day after, we more disappointed by that or by the, the that Kardashian photo. And that that might be the most shocking thing I've ever seen on TMZ. You can't, you can't even have them shake hands, in my opinion. It's not worth the photo. Don't even go there. Just tell, just say, oh, we the wives can't meet him, but they can come, but they they don't get to be in the handshake line, and then you've eliminated that photograph from him. That completely day. trumps. See, this is why the Kardashians have just, you know, they've outdone Paris Hilton. I thought it was crazy when. When Jerry Buss got his star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and Paris Hilton shows up, and she somehow just you know shoehorned mm-hmm. her way into this, just obviously because there were cameras there. Yeah. But that's nothing like the White House. I'm 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 more shocked and upset by Khloe Kardashian being there shaking that president's hand than those two, you know, intruders that weaseled their way into the White House. Me too. State dinner. I don't trust anyone in that family. <laughs> let me uh, let me throw this scenario at you, and you give me odds because I know you have to go. Washington somehow voids Arenas' contract. They trade Butler. They trade Jameson. They have all this cap room all of a sudden. They lure LeBron. Last week of October, Sports Illustrated comes out. LeBron Obama on the cover with some sort of chief and staff headline, something like that. What are the odds that we see that cover? 20 to 1? King and the president. The king and the prez? Right. 20 to 1? The odds that what? The odds that that Sports Illustrated cover happens. LeBron and Obama with with LeBron in a Wizards uniform and Obama oh, yeah. and the King oh, of the Oh, yeah. Coast. If he goes to Washington, that's definitely him. I mean, I mean, if you had Ronald Reagan and Patrick Ewing, which, if you think about it, <laughs> makes no sense. If I, had to rank, if I had to rank the LeBron teams, I would put Washington in the top five because I do think that it you know, it would be take a lot for those – things to work out. But if they did work out, that is a very viable option for him and a place that has a ton of basketball history and all that stuff. If, if Jameson and Butler leave? Yeah. Uh, that, would, that would have to happen. By himself, I, I was told by one of the LeBron guys that it's, it's championships. That's the, that's the criteria. Yeah, but they could have, you could have LeBron, Bosch. I mean, Washington has no salary cap next year. He could basically be the GM of his own team. Um, I think it's going to be Chicago. I keep saying this, nobody believes me. I think him and Bosch are in Chicago next year. And second choice would be um, a team that we are not even considering, like a team like Dallas or the Celtics or somebody. Or LeBron Clippers. is basically going to be able to decide where he plays next year. If he says, I want to be a Maverick next year, it'll happen. You know? They'll, they'll whatever. Cleveland, what is Cleveland going to do? Like stand in the way of it? If he's leaving, he's leaving. they got to get something for him. But I think it's going to be Chicago. You don't agree? I mean, that, that's like a, a dark horse. I've I've thought Miami or Cleveland. I don't think I Cleveland's don't see Miami. completely. I think Cleveland's going to be out. Are you of the opinion that winning a championship helps or hurts his chances of staying? I don't think it matters. I think it matters more what they can do with next year's team. And as you said, I think he's all about winning championships and being surrounded. I think... The underrated thing of this last seven years was that he was trapped with bad teammates. You know, the only All Star he ever played with was Mo Williams. And Mo Williams didn't deserve to make the All Star team. He only made it because he was on LeBron's team. This guy's never played with a real second banana, somebody who could help him. And uh, I just think, you know, if I'm him, and if Chicago can cut out Heinrich's contract and he can go there with Bosch, because let's face it, LeBron and Bosch are a package deal. I think they're going to be wherever one and you guy got goes. Yeah, then you got him, Derek Rose, and Joe Noah. And, uh, you know, maybe you could sign and trade Lil Dang for Joe Johnson. They create the super team. Can you think of a more perfect place for Joe Kim Noah than playing with LeBron and Derek Rose? He would be in heaven. How about him next to Bosch? That's a nice little one two big man punch. Oh, I, it's kind of like Varage. Don't you think Noah's Noah kind of like Varage Al? Yeah, he's a better Varage. Varage Al over Noah. Oh, I'd take Noah. I like that because he's younger and whatever. But the two best basketball situations for him are um, the Clippers, Clippers and the Bulls. Because, you know, to have Derrick Rose basically on this cheap contract for the next three years 
and the guy's a top 20 guy now, you know, and then Noah, who's the second rebounder in the league, and then you can bring Bosch with you. That's a monster. So anyway, that's my prediction. If you had to bet your life, who would you pick? I'll say Cleveland. I mean, I, I still think, you know, they, they've, it's Cleveland and then the field. I'd pick Chicago. You know, I, I think Cleveland has as, as good a chance as, as any place. And then you talk about all the other places competing against each other. I'm taking Chicago. I wouldn't mind going to Chicago. I'm feeling it. Year. I'm feeling Chicago. I hope, I hope you're right. I would love to go to Chicago. As you time. said, he is all about the championships, and it's a big market, and it's the most logical place. We have to go. Jay Donde, as always, a pleasure. We're, so any stories coming up, any TV appearances you want to plug, anything? Everything. You know, of course, Roundhorn today uh, um, and Monday and – and am I going to see you at the Black Super Bowl in Dallas? You will, you will see me at the Black Super Bowl. If you want, I'm going to go to Dealey Plaza one of those days and check out uh, where they shot JFK from the grassy knoll. It's, if you're interested. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny thing. Cause I, I, first time in Dallas, I say, okay, i got to go there. And you drive around. I'm looking at the map trying to find And then you just see it. And it's weird when you see something that you know, even though you've never seen it before. Because yeah. you've seen that area so many times. You've seen that footage so many times that the second you see it, it's like you grew up there. It's like deja vu. You know, it's weird. One of the places when when you're in one of the places where history changes. There's not too many places you can visit in the world where you can say history changed on this spot, and that's one of them. I am very excited to go there. I'm excited for the Black Super Bowl. Excited to see you. Thanks for coming on the uh, BS Report. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. All right. Before I get the sun off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. You laughed, you cried, you turned up the sound repeatedly, and now it's all over. This concludes another installment of the BS Report. And with all the talk about sports, Bill Simmons neglected to mention this important just-breaking news. <clears throat> Subway is home to the famous $5 footlong, so celebrate your favorite Subway famous $5 footlong, like the classic BLT or the Big Bowl Black Forest Ham and Cheese. All stacked your way with the meats, cheeses, and fresh, crisp veggies you love. 